Hi, and welcome back to Hacker 101. This is the third and final session in our mobile app hacking series. In the last two sessions, we first talked about mobile app hacking in general, then talked about getting started with Android hacking. If you haven't watched those yet, pause and check those out first. In this session, we're going to discuss getting started with hacking apps on iOS. We'll talk about essential tools, some key differences between testing Android apps and iOS apps, and some tips for success. First, let's talk about how iOS apps are structured and some key knowledge about the on-disk format. Applications are typically distributed as IPA packages. Conveniently, these are just zip files with a different extension, so you can simply change the extension and unzip it like normal. Inside this, you'll find a bunch of metadata, signatures, and most importantly, the payload slash app name dot app directory. That's where most of the interesting bits will be, like the application binary. One important thing to keep in mind is that binaries and IPAs from the App Store will, by default, be encrypted. Without decrypting this, it's not possible to disassemble, decompile, or otherwise mess with the binary. We'll talk about how you can decrypt these apps a little bit later in the session. Finally, the info.plist file in the root of the IPA contains a huge number of properties about the application. From the application name and version to the URL schemes it registers, this data is essential for running the application as intended. Most of this has no bearing on security or testing, but there are a few notable exceptions, which are covered later in the session. Now let's talk about the differences in testing iOS apps versus Android apps. While there are many similarities between the operating systems from a user perspective, and even a developer perspective really, there are massive differences from the perspective of a security researcher. The one that tends to drive me nuts is that in the Android world, you have an emulator capable of running practically any app. If it's pure Dalvik, like most apps are, then you could just run it via the nice x86 emulator and everything just works. If it's got native ARM code, you switch to the ARM emulator and things are fine, just slow. In the iOS world, the only thing you have is the simulator, which runs only x86 apps which is to say nothing from the app store. If you have source code, then you can build the app and run it in the simulator, but that's not going to be the case for most things you care about. This means that in the vast majority of real world cases, you're going to need to test on a real device. We'll talk later about how to actually best do that. And the one that poses the biggest challenge reverse engineering wise, iOS apps with a few notable exceptions are compiled straight to native machine code. In the Android world, you can decompile most apps pretty painlessly. They may have bits of native code that you can't so easily decompile, but usually those are small portions and you can either just disassemble and read, or ignore entirely. That's not doable in the iOS world. Unless you're dealing with an app built with one of the JS for native apps frameworks like React Native, Titanium, or PhoneGap, you're pretty much stuck with disassembling the app and decompiling specific methods with a lot of manual work. This does pose fun and interesting challenges, and I personally like that. It definitely raises the barrier to entry pretty considerably, though. Next, let's discuss some tools I feel are essential for success in iOS testing. Some of these have overlapping uses, but they all have their place. First up is Xcode. This is Apple's main development environment, which you can use to develop, build, and debug iOS apps. The simulator we talked about earlier is a part of the Xcode package. The ability to quickly build and run test apps is pretty key to testing on iOS, as it may lead to ways that you can test a bug in isolation. Next is BF Inject. This tool lets you inject a shared library, a dilib file, into running apps on iOS. Using this, you're able to do pretty much anything in the context of an app, including decrypting it. We'll talk about exactly how to use this to decrypt an IPA a bit later, but needless to say, this is absolutely essential for testing iOS apps these days. SciCrypt is a sort of similar concept, but with very different design. Rather than having to build some shared library, you just write code in their own little variant of JavaScript, which adds niceties like list comprehensions and Objective-C method calls. If you want to exercise some specific function in an application, there's really no better way to do it than via SciCrypt. It's helped me find and understand tons of interesting functions and related bugs. Frida is a tool that we discussed in the Android session as well. It's a system for runtime instrumentation of code, which means that you can write scripts to manipulate and inspect running applications. 
The full scope of what Frida can do could fill a very large book, but some common tasks are to watch file I.O., inspect network connections, and disable certificate pinning. The Frida site has a lot of great resources to learn more, and the community at large has released thousands of useful scripts. Next up is Cydia Impactor. This tool is most useful if you're running a non-jailbroken device, we'll talk about that part in a bit, where you can easily and automatically self-sign an IPA and install it on your device. This lets you get around the code signing restrictions on iOS. If you can't or don't want to jailbreak a device, being able to do things like patch Frida into an IPA and push it to your device is essential for testing. I very much recommend this tool. Hopper is a personal favorite of mine. It's not free, but it is an affordable disassembler and decompiler, and it's particularly good at decompiling Objective-C apps like on iOS. It'll never give you perfect results, often they're laughably bad, but they're near as good as you can get from native code decompilation without spending many thousands of dollars. It's certainly good enough to get an understanding of what's going on in the code. SSL Kill Switch 2 is perhaps the most straightforward of the tools on the list. It does one thing and it does it well. It disables certificate pinning for any apps using the system standard SSL libraries. That covers most apps, but we'll talk about the exceptions later. Finally, Burp Suite Mobile Assistant. This tool is installed on the device and helps you easily set up your proxy, accept the CA certificate, and verify that everything works properly. As of this recording, it doesn't work on the latest iOS versions, but I imagine they'll update it down the road. And speaking of Burp and CA certificate setup, let's talk about how you can do that without the Burp Suite Mobile Assistant. For the simulator, it's pretty simple. It uses your system proxy settings. Set that like normal and you're good to go. The issue that I have with this approach though is that I don't want my whole system going through Burp. So when I need to test via the simulator, I actually set up a second proxy called Provoxy. This is an ad blocking proxy normally, but it's highly configurable so that you can easily write rules for where specific traffic should go. Once you've got it installed, you just point your system proxy settings to it, then tell it which IPs or host names should go to Burp. Pretty straightforward and very useful. For physical devices, proxy settings are under the Wi-Fi settings. Simply click the I next to the network to which you're connected, then click Manual under HTTP Proxy Settings, then plug in the info for your proxy. Do make sure that Burp is listening either on all interfaces or on the local network interface. If it's on localhost only, your device won't be able to talk to it. Also, I suggest disabling cell service while you're using a proxy, so you don't miss any traffic if it decides to go that route for some reason. Installing the CA cert is one area where iOS testing is way easier than Android. Once you've got your proxy set up and working, go to http colon slash slash burp and click the CA certificate link in the top right corner. You'll be prompted to install the cert. Follow these prompts and you should be able to open any HTTPS site, no problem. Now let's talk about the elephant in the room, jailbreaking. Jailbreaking is, in my opinion, essential for effective testing of iOS apps, but it's a quagmire in more ways than one. Let's dive into this. The first thing to know is that you should never, ever, ever jailbreak your primary device. It pretty severely damages the security posture of your device, and if it's one you use for work, your IT people will hate you, and with good reason. If you wouldn't unlock your device and hand it over to a stranger in a bar, don't jailbreak it, period. But with all of that said, you probably should have a jailbroken iOS device if you want to test iOS apps successfully. It's not impossible to do it otherwise, but it's not easy. The actual process of jailbreaking a device differs based on which model it is and which version of iOS is running. Unfortunately, the latest devices in iOS versions often aren't jailbreakable for a while after release, which makes it hard to just jump into this stuff. I personally went to eBay and bought an iPod Touch, which I have a jailbreakable iOS version running on. It'll stay on this version until the device dies, because the risk of not being able to jailbreak future versions is just too high. I suggest picking up a slightly older used device. There's a very high likelihood that you'll be able to jailbreak it and test on it just fine. Some apps won't run on an iPod Touch, but we'll actually talk about a way to get around that. Finally, we come to the part of the session where we discuss some essential testing tips and tricks.
To decrypt an IPA, you can use BF Inject. It has a great decryption function built right in. You simply run, on the device, the command on screen now, replacing app name with the actual name on disk of the application you're trying to decrypt. Once you do that, it'll go ahead and start the decryption, then set up a little server where it'll serve the decrypted IPA and tell you the command to run on your computer in order to download it. Cert pinning isn't something you'll run into for most apps, though they really should have it, but it is something that will cause headaches when present. If your proxy is set up properly but you're not able to get an app working after setting it up, it's likely that cert pinning is the root cause. Burp Suite Mobile Assistant or SSL Kill Switch 2 will handle the vast majority of cases. Simply follow their setup instructions and things should just work. However, if they fail, then there's really not a simple prescribed path to take to fix it. My suggestion is to use Frida to hook calls to OpenSSL and see if they're using that. Then you can intercept the calls and disable cert pinning manually that way. If they're not using OpenSSL though, then you're likely going to have to crack it open in a disassembler and figure out how to patch the cert pinning out by hand or via some well-placed Frida interceptions. Some apps will only install on iPads, but this is something you can actually get around. This is something I've had to do multiple times since my primary device is an iPod Touch. If you open up the IPA and edit the info.plist file, you'll find a key called UI Device Family. Changing the value to 1 will allow it to install on any device. Simply repackage it and send it over with Cydia Impactor, and it should install and run just fine. It's very possible the UI will behave oddly or be very hard to see, but it should more or less work. In the Android world, the majority of the code running is in inherently safe languages. Objective-C is mostly safe. Their string classes prevent you from shooting yourself in the foot, for instance. But its C legacy leaves open the potential for memory corruption bugs. These are cases where input causes memory to be corrupted in a controllable way, leading to anything from information disclosure to remote code execution. Most memory corruption can be leveraged to nefarious ends, generally leading to critical bugs. We're not going to go too far down the rabbit hole here. Hacker 101 videos in the second quarter of 2019 will talk about this in more detail. But I suggest looking in your disassembler or decompiler for any instances of calls like memcopy, stircopy, and sprintf as a first pass. If you can find a way to get your input to run off the end of a buffer, you've almost certainly got something you can have fun with. There are plenty of other ways memory corruption happens and can be exploited, but we can't go too much into that in this video. The final thing we'll talk about is the custom URL scheme functionality in iOS. Applications can register to be launched by a specific URL scheme via the browser or other apps. While these are often innocuous, they can lead to some really nasty bugs. Most of them will either be triggering an XSS payload in a web view or a memory corruption bug deeper in the app. The fact that you can pass in a URL means you have a lot of space in which to write your exploit. That's not something you get too often in mobile apps. Now with all that being said, congratulations on taking your first steps to becoming an iOS app hacker. There's a lot more to learn, but this will provide you with a good starting point. If you haven't done so already, please consider giving the video a like and subscribing to our channel for more great content. As always, thanks for watching and happy breaking.